Attention Institute personnel. This investigation marks the release of Templin 2.0. To celebrate, anyone pledged to our Patreon page at $10 and above before November 30th will receive an exclusive and limited edition Operation Thundershark patch. There's been a ton of changes to the Templin Institute, so stick around after this episode for more details. The Emperor wills it, and you shall obey. In the grim darkness of the far future, the age of the Imperium is over. Across the universe, a death knell has sounded, for the time of ending has begun. Tyranid hive fleets move inexorably towards the guiding light of the Astronomicon. Orcs in the trillions gather around the banners of the warlord Gazgul Thraka. Necron tombs, silent for millennia, now awaken and a warp storm of unprecedented fury has torn the galaxy in two. The final prelude, it is whispered, to the ultimate victory of the ruinous powers. The fate of humanity rests with the myriad of forces at the Imperium's command. A single shot fired by the Officio Assassinorum can end a rebellion before it begins. The Collegia Titanica can grind entire worlds to powder. The Adepta Sororitas can cast the holy word of the Emperor to even the darkest corners of the galaxy. But of all the armies to have ever raised their weapons and banners in the defense of mankind, there is one above all through which the destiny of the Imperium will be decided. Each day on a million worlds, women and men, ordinary citizens of the Imperium, depart their homes, often never to return. They are sent to the front lines of wars beyond number and against eldritch creatures, immortal warriors, and the powers of hell itself, expected to hold the line. They are slaughtered in the ruins of once proud cities, in the depths of forgotten battlefields, and to the laughter of thirsting gods. But for 10,000 years, that line has held. For 10,000 years, one force in the galaxy has stood against the enemies of the Imperium and spoken to them in the language of fire. Each day on a million worlds, women and men, ordinary citizens of the Imperium, depart their homes so they might fight for humanity as soldiers in the Astra Militarum, the Imperial Guard. The scale and complexity of the Imperial Guard rivals that of the Imperium itself. It is the largest coordinated fighting force in the galaxy, serving as the first and often only line of defense against the innumerable powers that threaten the continued existence of mankind. While it is famous for the vast numbers of tanks, aircraft, and artillery under its command, at its core, it is comprised of countless billions of mortal soldiers, organized into hundreds of thousands of regiments. The recruitment of these regiments is among the most pivotal duties assigned to every Imperial Commander, Planetary Lord, or Imperial Governor. According to the law of the Imperium, every world under its authority must maintain a standing army to preserve the planetary government and deter any form of internal insurrection or foreign invasion. Each of these planetary defense forces exist as their own individual bodies, free to defend their own world and enforce their own standards as they see fit, provided they contribute a fraction of their number to serve the wider Imperium and join the Imperial Guard. The method by which these troops are recruited varies significantly from sector to sector and planet to planet. Defense forces of many worlds are little more than rival gangs, nomadic tribesmen, or condemned criminals, and selection for service within the Imperial Guard is often done under threat of summary execution. Other planets might have well-established professional standing armies who view recruitment into the Imperial Guard as a noble, heroic pursuit. However the individuals and units selected to join the Imperial Guard are chosen, their quality reflects on that world's ruler. Should a regiment provided to the Imperial Guard be of insufficient quality, the life of even a planetary governor is immediately forfeit. For this reason, the soldiers selected for the Astra Militarum tend to be drawn from the elite troops of any planetary defense force. Even so, the composition and number of regiments drawn from each planet is wildly diverse. A highly industrialized hive world with a trillion imperial citizens might be required to provide hundreds of millions of soldiers 
tens of millions of tanks, and other mechanized equipment. These would be supplemented by professional uniforms, munitions, replacement parts, and every manner of material required to outfit and sustain a force of that size. An agricultural or feudal world, by contrast, might have a significantly lower military tribute, providing as little as a million men and a hundred thousand cavalry. Such soldiers may lack even the most rudimentary equipment and possess little experience handling anything more complex than a windmill. This enormous disparity within the Imperial Guard makes any attempt at standardization impossible. Every regiment is equipped in the manner of their homeworld, and many such worlds have grown famous for the conduct of their soldiers. Prized by even the Adeptus Terra as the epitome of the Astra Militarum are the Cadian Shock Troops. The regiments of Cadia are equipped with the highest standards of gear available, and the martial culture of their homeworld has imbued every soldier with a natural affinity for life in military service. Cadia itself is but a memory, destroyed during the 13th Black Crusade of Abaddon the Despoiler, but that memory has served the Imperium as much in death as in life. Factory worlds across the galaxy produce equipment for the Imperial Guard to Cadian specifications, and countless regiments are trained and deployed in the fashion of their Cadian brethren. Equally legendary, if less ubiquitous regiments, are raised on worlds spanning the breadth of the Imperium. The Ice Warriors of Valhalla are said to be as inexorable as the winter itself, ruthless as the bitter frost, and as certain as death. They have acquired an infamous reputation for their thundering artillery barrages, combined with waves of charging infantry. Valhallans are the masters of Arctic warfare, viewed by outsiders as somehow impervious to harsh conditions or the value of human life. Fueled by the forges of their hive world and millennia of warfare are the regiments of the Armageddon Steel Legion. Highly mechanized and mobile, the Steel Legion has an unequaled number of tanks and armored personnel carriers in their service, and time and time again have charged across the wastelands of Armageddon, supported in the skies above by gunships and fighter aircraft. The Mordian Iron Guard are widely derided for their stiff and unforgiving demeanor, ridiculed as more troubled with maintaining their brightly colored uniforms and marching in perfect formation than the more pragmatic concerns of soldiery. Such discipline is an absolute necessity on their strictly rationed homeworld, however, and in battle, their iron resolve makes them cold-blooded killers. They will hold their ground at any cost, laying waste to the enemy with perfectly disciplined fire. The desert raiders of Talarn, by contrast, are unequaled within the guard for their guerrilla tactics. Evasive and opportunistic, they have perfected the doctrine of hit-and-run warfare, harassing their opponents without mercy before disappearing into the dust kicked up by their rugged mounts. Every regiment in the Astra Militarum, regardless of their homeworld, possess some level of fatalism, but none can match the notoriously grim warriors of the Death Corps of Krieg. Once a prosperous hive world, Krieg today is an atomic wasteland, the result of a rebellion against the Imperium for which its soldiers must now atone. They are synonymous with their heavy greatcoats and sinister gas masks, rarely removing them even to eat or drink. They specialize in wars of attrition, where their willingness to die for the Emperor exceeds any other consideration. But in the minds of many across the Imperium, Katachan alone is a worthy successor to Cadia. It is a death world of unrelenting butchery, where every plant, animal, and insect are hostile to human life. Katachans have a well-deserved reputation as the deadliest jungle warfare experts in the galaxy, as even the bloodiest battle might be a favorable reprieve compared to life on their homeworld. Close combat is their particular specialty, along with extensive use of traps, mines, and improvised weaponry. With no other resources, knowledge, or worth, regiments of jungle fighters are the sole export of Katachan and used to devastating effect. There are countless other regiments of renown within the Astra Militarum. The Vastroian Firstborn, the Attilan Rough Riders, the Elysian Drop Troops, or the Tanith First and Only. But for every world or regiment honored for the heroism and dedication of its soldiers, a thousand more remain unsung and forgotten. 
save by the emperor himself. Regardless of their origin, every regiment is subordinate to the Lord Commander Militant. In theory, this individual passes on the dictates of the High Lords of Terra to the Lord Commander of each segmentum, who in turn hold authority and responsibility for vast swaths of the galaxy. In practice, the Lord Commander Militant is primarily a political position, more concerned with overseeing the bureaucracy of the Departmento Munitorum and devoted to the general administration, personnel assignment, supply, and military logistics of the Imperial Guard, rather than any direct orders to its armies. In the rare instances in which centralized command has been imposed over far-flung Imperial regiments, the results are often disastrous. The unpredictable realities of faster-than-light travel mean that communiques and orders arrive years or decades after they were meant to or in a single garbled transmission impossible to understand. Entire wars have been lost when dogmatic commanders have stubbornly implemented nonsensical orders to their subordinates. The practicalities of the galaxy and of command instead dictate that authority over the Imperial Guard falls to the officer of the highest rank in any given theater of war. While such a command structure is plagued by overlapping regions of authority, competing commanders issuing conflicting orders, and needless complexity, it is the only method by which the Astra Militarum can remain flexible enough to remain operationally effective. Individual commanders vary tremendously in their approach. Some command from miles behind the front lines, or from the relative safety of low orbit. Others are present where fighting is thickest, leading their soldiers through example. In other cases, Astra Militarum forces are subordinate to other branches of the Imperial military. It is not uncommon for Imperial Guard regiments to supplement the Space Marines of the Adeptus Astartes, the Scitari of the Adeptus Mechanicus, or any other force as required. In rare cases, such as during an Imperial Crusade or an extraordinary threat to the entire Imperium, a commander within the Astra Militarum might be granted the title of War Master. This individual is second only to the Lord Commander Militant and the supreme authority over every Imperial military force within their area of operations. There is rarely more than one War Master within the Imperium at any one time, and many who are granted it prefer to instead be known as a High Solar rather than be associated with the very first Imperial War Master, the traitor Horus. The organizational structures of the Astra Militarum are defined by the ancient text known as the Tactica Imperium. Its knowledge stretches back into antiquity, and many of its teachings predate the rule of the Emperor, the Dark Age of Technology, and the unification of ancient Terra. At its most basic tenets, the Tactica Imperium groups squads together based on their specialization. Infantry platoons comprise infantry companies, which in turn make up infantry regiments. Tank, cavalry, artillery, and support regiments are structured in this same manner. Regiments together, therefore, complement each other's strengths and weaknesses, ensuring that the army as a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Like every other facet of the Imperial Guard, the composition of its regiments again varies wildly. When facing the massed numbers of a Tyranid swarm or the hit-and-fade tactics of the Drakari, the standardized methods of organization lose their effectiveness and entire armies must be restructured to best combat these threats. More varied and versatile deployments are often favored by local commanders. Amongst the more exotic forces utilized by the Astra Militarum are the warp-sensitive psychers of Scholastica Sycana. Their value to the Imperial Guard outweighs the moral repugnance they evoke, unleashing warp-fueled devastation equal to an entire company of heavy guns. Less unusual, but still uncommon within the Imperial Guard, are the varieties of abhumans within the Militarum Auxilla. Millennia of mutations and extreme environmental conditions have shaped sub-races of hulking ogrins and keen-eyed ratlings, who have found great success as shock troopers and scouts, respectively. A common saying is that the only true standardized piece of Imperial equipment issued to every regiment is a commissar. Such a thing would never be said within their presence, however, for it is the task of these political officers to maintain the morale and loyalty of their troops, doing so typically at gunpoint. 
A commissar has the authority to overrule even the commanding officer of a regiment, and can inspire their charges to accomplish what might have seemed impossible. Even the unassuming las gun, the most widely used weapon of the Imperial Guard, exists in a thousand models and variations. It can be constructed out of wood and plastic, metal and composites, emblazoned with golden sigils, or garish, improvised improvements. It can function as a sniper rifle or pistol, a lightweight weapon easier to handle and aim, or illegally modified to deliver more energy per shot. It can be built in advanced assembly lines or by hastily trained peasants. It functions even when covered in dust, mud, or drenched in water. Neither blazing heat or frigid cold impedes its effectiveness. It is simple and reliable, a perfect metaphor for the Imperial Guard. The modern Astra Militarum began as the Imperial Army. The force was first used by the Emperor of Man during the Wars of Unification on Earth, and later to support the advances of the Space Marine Legions during the Great Crusade. During this time, the Imperial Army commanded land, air, and space assets, with no differentiation between the space-based and ground-based branches of the service. The betrayal by Warmaster Horus and the subsequent civil war he unleashed forever tarnished the reputation of the Imperial Army. Unnumbered regiments joined the traitor legions, spreading death and corruption across the Imperium. When it was reformed as the Astra Militarum, all naval assets were stripped from its command and organized into the complementary Imperial Navy. With neither force able to mount a campaign without the support of the other, the threat of another large-scale rebellion was, in theory, removed. In all the ages since, the Imperial Guard has remained the backbone of the Imperium's defense. Its forces have fought across every battlefield against every foe, enduring the stain of defeat and seizing the exultation of victory. Its greatest commanders have entered the highest pantheon of Imperial heroes, with names like Caiaphas Cain, Sly Marbo, Ibram Gaunt, Lord Solar Macarius, Sebastian Yerrick, and Usarkar Creed known across the entire galaxy. It is the name Olanius Pius, however, that is revered above all others. The extent of his deeds and whether such a man ever existed at all has been lost to antiquity. But, according to legend, at the height of the Horus Heresy, as the Imperial Palace and all Terra burned beneath the might of the ruinous powers, a single man placed himself between the Emperor of Mankind and the arch-traitor Horus Lupercal, Warmaster and Chosen of the Four Gods of Chaos. Some accounts claim it was a Terminator of the Adeptus Astartes, or a warrior of the Legio Custodes, but every guardsman knows with certainty that he was nothing more than an ordinary man. A mortal soldier who faced down the greatest terror all reality had to offer and died standing. Alien tyrants, immortal intelligences, the dark gods, and the universe itself make mockery of human life. For against the terrible foes of mankind, a single guardsman alone can do nothing. But a guardsman is never alone. They are deployed into battle alongside their fire teams, their squads and sections, their platoons, companies, and regiments. Their armies cover entire continents, entire worlds. Behind them roar the engines of battle tanks bearing the names of immortal heroes, formations of war machines of such scale and power that entire mountains might be ground to dust beneath their treads. Overhead, the skies are filled with gunships and attack craft, unleashing such fury that the sun itself is concealed behind the black smoke of rocket propellant. At night, entire horizons are lit with the fires of heavy guns, a declaration to the enemies of the Imperium that they have come here to die. But should every world fall, every fortress be overrun, and the gates of Terra defended by the last guardsmen in the Imperium, they will still not stand alone. The spirit of the Emperor is with all who fight in his name. And while no army is big enough to conquer the galaxy, faith alone can overturn the universe.
As mentioned at the start of this investigation, we have completely overhauled the visual style of the Templin Institute as part of what we're calling Templin 2.0. You might have noticed this episode looked a little different compared to our previous ones, but the changes don't stop there. Join us immediately, as in right now, on Twitch, where we're celebrating Templin 2.0 with a game of Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War. We've also redesigned our Twitch interface, so check it out. But if you're watching this in the grim darkness of the far future, you can find all our streams on the Templin Archives channel. On top of the visual changes introduced as part of Templin 2.0, we've also completely redesigned the Templin Commissary. If you'd like to get yourself a Templin Institute hat, pillow, or maybe a flag imported from the Greater Terran Union, use offer code THUNDERSHARK for a 10% discount until November 30th. Templin 2.0 introduced a ton of new changes, way more than we can hope to list in this quick notice. So for all the details, check out the link in the description. And as always, thanks for your support.